Good morning, Woodlands Church. Good morning, those of you watching online, watching in your homes, hopefully not in your cars, somewhere, uh, watching in the chapel. So good to worship with you all this morning. Will you stand and join with us in worship today? As, we're, uh, as we sing, I want to read us a passage of Psalm 96. Psalm 96 says this, says, Sing a new song to the Lord, and let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord and bless his name Proclaim his salvation from day to day and declare his glory among the nations. Hear that. Declare his glory among the nations, his wondrous works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord, he made the heavens. The splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. As this morning we are reminded from Psalm 96 that Praise, our praise in this room is not meant to be contained by this room. It's meant to be taken out of this room when we leave and into our community and into our world. Uh, That's the command of the psalmist is to praise the Lord amongst the nations, to go out and praise and sing loudly. So guys, let's practice our worship this morning. Let's sing out loudly and sing out boldly to our God. Let's sing together. Turn into revival 
Sing this out.
God praise. As we uh, move into the next portion of the service, I want to ask you guys to take a seat. Uh, we want to give you guys some space. And in the midst of um, our lives, we don't often slow down to just sit and rest in the reality that the Lord loves us. And sometimes many of our idol, much of our idol worship is born out of the reality that um, we don't sit in God's love and realize that our worth and our value, our hope, our dreams, they all sit within the fact that God loves us and he made us. So Brooke is going to read uh, a passage out of Psalm 63, and then we want to sing a song over you guys. Uh, well, uh, you can sit in that passage. The passage will be rotating on the screens while we sing that, um, and we'll ask you to stand in a little bit. But Brooke, you want to read that? God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you. In a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name, I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me with rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night watches because you are my helper. I will rejoice in the shadow of your wings.
Now we stand and join us and sing again. Sing about God's love. It's a foundation upon which we can build our life. Father, that is our prayer to you, that, God, we would build our life upon your love, for your faithful love is better than life. God, there are so many things in this world that keep us from doing what you've called us to do, from, that is, called us to go out to our neighbor, to our world, to the nations, and share your gospel, and show who you are by our words and our deeds. God, there are so many things that distract us from that mission. God, we pray that you would do away with all those idols and that we would sit and rest in your love and in your goodness. And that, God, in your love, you would go out, uh, to, you would send us out to those around us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray that you give us the grace and strength to do that. Teach us now in this moment through your spirit. We love you. Pray all this in your name and all God's people said. Amen. You can have a seat. So good to worship God together. Good morning. My name is David Hansen. I have the privilege of serving you as part of our staff team here. And uh, those watching online, those in the chapel, those of us in the auditorium, it's just really good to be together and worship. And I have to tell you, I've just really enjoyed the reminder of the change of seasons around here as we've worshiped here this morning. Such a good thing. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, Discover Woodlands was scheduled for today at noon. We're actually pushing that back to January. So those of you who are planning to come back for that, you can wait until January, but continue to stay a part of what we do here. Um, also, this coming Thursday night is our congregational meeting, and we just really encourage you to make that a priority. It's at 6.30. It'll be in the chapel. We will give you an update on how we're doing with our finances, but also give you a quick update on the Grace investigation and uh, welcome new members into our church, which is always a sweet time. And then Thursday, November 23rd is our Thanksgiving service, one of my favorites around here, and we get to enjoy pie together afterwards too. So feel free to bring a pie. It's at 6.30 in, this, in the auditorium. It'll be a special night as we... Um, just give thanks to God for all he has done. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning just so grateful. This has been a week where we've had an opportunity to remember the veterans who have so faithfully served this country, men and women that have sacrificed much. And we think of the National Guard over these last couple of years as we have uh, navigated this pandemic. Families have been separated as people have taken on the responsibility to serve the people of this country so faithfully. We thank you. As Thanksgiving approaches, it's our prayer that every one of these families would just find sweet joy as they get to be together. We pray, Father, that there would be uh, times of blessing, times of refreshment, and that we as a church would be people who just express gratitude and thanksgiving to the men and women who serve so faithfully in this country, and thank you for how that's happened through the generations. We are grateful. Jesus, through the power of your Spirit, we pray that you would move powerfully as Pastor Brian comes and delivers the message here this morning to us that you would be working in his heart and just reminding us of the remarkable call you've placed on all of us to love the world and the people that you place throughout the world who just so desperately need you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, good morning to you. Thanks for being with us for worship today. Question on the screen is the question that has often, well, it was on the screen, uh, question that has so often been in people's minds in these last uh, few months, two years. What in the world? <laughs> what in the world is happening? What in the world is going on? All the changes, all the chaos, a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, so many people's uh, lives have been disrupted by that. Countries have been at odds with each other. What in the world? We as Christians ask a little bit different question, a better question, a question that's guided by Scripture. The question we ask is, what in the world is God up to in the world? Because we believe in a God who's sovereign. We believe in a God who's all-powerful. We believe in a God who holds the whole world in his hands. And so he has purposes, he has plans, he has things that he's up to. So what in the world are those purposes? What in the world are those plans? That's what we want to think about for two weeks. We're going to answer that question on two levels in these next two weeks. Uh, what in the world is God up to? This morning we're going to look at the big global purpose of God. The purpose that is that was initiated or told to us in Genesis and is reiterated all the way to the book of Revelation. We're going to look at that great big global purpose that helps us make sense of what's going on in the world. And next week we're going to look at, if that's God's global purpose, next week he's going to be, what are his plans to achieve that purpose? In light of what he has told us is his purpose in the world, what specific things are, is he doing, does he invite us to be a part of, to uh, accomplish that purpose? Why is this important? Why for two weeks are we going to think about what in the world is God up to? For two reasons. One, because it gives us hope. It helps us to make sense out of a chaotic world. It sets our minds on the bigger picture of God and what he is up to in the world. The good purpose, and you're going to see it's a very good purpose this morning that he's up to. And second of all, because we should care about what he cares about. We should join him in what he is involved in. Bob Pierce, the, the founder of World Vision that great humanitarian Christian organization, used to pray this. He used to pray, God, teach me to love what you love and to hate what you hate. He used to pray that over my kids for years. He also would pray, God, break my heart with the things that break your heart. So we should care what he's about in the world, what matters to him ought to matter to us. So we need to review again what it is that matters so much to him. So if you have your Bibles, turn back to Genesis. We're going to start in Genesis. And uh, point number one, we're going to start at the beginning of the Bible. What is God's global purpose? It first started to come to light when God came to Abraham, leading up to Abraham's life. Go to Genesis 12, leading up to Abraham's life. Remember the fall happened. Sin came into the world, not the fall of leaves, but the fall of man. The fall happened, and sin came into the world, and people were alienated and separated from God. 
Uh, God judged the earth with a, a global flood. He scattered the earth at the Tower of Babel because of their common intent to rebel against him. And after all of that happened in Genesis 1 through 11, then he steps into history, chooses this man named Abraham, and begins to unveil and to reveal and to accomplish this great global purpose, which is still ongoing in ways that are stunning to this day that you're going to hear a little bit about today and next week. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. And here it comes. And I will make you, Abraham. Remember, Abraham didn't know God at all. God just came to him. I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. So you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. The ones who curse you, I will cur curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So two parts of this global purpose that are revealed here to Abraham is that God is going to take and make the descendants of Abraham extraordinarily numerous. I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham. And Abraham, through you, I mean, imagine God coming to you and saying this. Through you, every family on the face of the earth one day will be blessed, Abraham. Well, Abraham, I'm sure, didn't understand what that fully meant, but it began to be unfolded a little bit more. Turn over to Genesis 15. Abraham had that promise ringing in his ears that he would be a great nation. All the families of the earth would be blessed, but he had no children. And so he began to wonder, how in the world is this going to happen? How in the world, you know, where's, I don't even have one child. And you're telling me that you're going to make me a great nation. God comes to him again. When Abraham begins to doubt, he reiterates the promise. And he expands a little bit in verse 5 of Genesis 15. He took him out. It says, God took him outside and said, Look toward the heavens. Count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. In number, like the stars of the heaven, this vast host. And remember, you know, there's no ambient light from street lights in those days, so he had a great view of the night sky. And it was filled with all these points of light. And he said, that's what your descendants are going to be like, Abraham. And that's where it says in the ne next phrase that Abraham believed that. As a model of faith for us, he believed what God said. God saw that belief and counted it as righteousness. We saw that in the book of Galatians, which we just finished. Turn over to Genesis 22. Because in Genesis 22, he's going to make the promise, the purpose, a little clearer for Abraham and for us as well. In Genesis 22, here's what he says to Abraham at verse 17. Abraham, indeed, I will bless you. I will greatly multiply your descendant or your seed. Now, it's a singular word. Your seed, your descendant, as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed, singular, shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. There's the reiteration of that purpose. Abraham, through you, through your seed, through your descendant, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. God extended the analogy a little bit. First he said, you know, they're going to be like the stars in the heaven. Now he says they're going to be like the sand that's on the seashore. And through one of them, through one of them, that promise that I made to bless all the families, all the nations, now he uses the word nations of the earth, is going to come through one person. We know from the, book of Genesis, or from the book of Galatians, we know from the rest of the New Testament, we now understand what that promise meant in Genesis chapter 22. We understand now that God was referring to a descendant of Abraham through the Jewish family called Jesus Christ, the God-man who would come. He was promising him at the beginning of humanity as we understand it. He was promising Abraham, there's going to come one through your line. And the purpose of that one, my purpose through that one, God is saying, is to bless all the nations and all the families of the earth. This promise is so important. This purpose is so clear that God is going to reiterate it twice to the son and the grandson of Abraham. So the son of Abraham is Isaac. 
Abraham dies and God comes to Isaac and he reiterates this promise. Abraham, or excuse me, Isaac is facing a famine in the ancient world. And God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, or excuse, comes to Isaac and says, Isaac, don't fear. And then he reiterates the purpose. I'm still going to do what I said I was going to do. Look at verse 4 of Genesis 26, if you're following in your Bibles. I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven. I will give your seed all of these lands, and by your seed, by your descendant, this one who will come from you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. There's the purpose again. Isaac, don't fear There's coming a day when all the nations of the earth, through that one who comes, who we now know as Jesus Christ, all the nations will be blessed. He reiterates the promise to to Jacob, to Abraham's grandson in uh, Genesis 28. In Genesis 28, verse 14. If you remember the story, Jacob has been sent away by his father and his mother because of the hatred of his brother toward him. Esau, his brother, hated Jacob, wanted to take his life, so Isaac and Rebekah send him away and and uh, to protect him. And as he's traveling away from his family to try and find a wife with his relatives, he has this wrestling match with God, you remember. And at the end of that wrestling match, God comes again to Jacob in this sense of turmoil that he's facing about his future, and he reiterates this purpose that is still playing out today, thousands of years later. He says the same thing again in in Genesis 28, verse 14. Your seed will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So what do we know? Now he's done a third analogy. First, it was the stars of the heaven. Then it was the sand on the seashore. Now it's like the dust of the earth. He's saying... Through this one who will come from your family, this one that we now know is Jesus Christ, I plan to bless all of the nations of the earth, and there will be so many who will be blessed from all those nations that they will be like the dust, like the stars, like the sand. And this great global purpose is still being pressed by God and still being fulfilled to this day. Through your seed, all the families, he said, all the nations will be blessed. Through your seed, they, the, the ones who will be blessed will be this vast, great number. So we know from the first book of the Bible that God has repeatedly promised to bless. To bring goodness to all the families and all the nations of the earth through the one seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ. This is God's great global purpose. This this purpose is constantly reiterated in the in the New Test in the Old Testament, the New Testament. We're only going to look at a few passages today as we take this sweep of the Bible. But here's another one. Point number two in your outline. If you're following along, it's reiterated in a key messianic psalm, Psalm two. You're going to hear this psalm at Christmas time as part of Handel's Messiah. It's reiterated in the New Testament, especially in Hebrews. In Hebrews, we learn that this psalm, Psalm two is talking about Jesus. And it's a unique psalm because there's a dialogue between God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, this one that was promised. And you're going to see this same purpose played out in this psalm. Psalm 2, let's let's see how it starts. Why are the nations, there's that word again, nations, why are the nations in an uproar? And the people's devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's his son, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. So verses 1 through 3 are the attitude of the nations of people like us to God. And it's an attitude of rebellion. It's an attitude of we want to go our own way. We want to do our own thing. So verses 1 through 3 are the nation's attitude toward God. Now God's going to tell them his response to that rebellion in the next verses. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He will speak to them in his anger, terrify them in his fury. But he will also say, but as for me, God the Father says, I have installed my king, that would be Jesus, 
upon Zion, my holy mountain. So God's response to the nations is scoffing. Would you really think you could rebel against me? Do you really think that you could have your way in the end against your creator? So first he scoffs, but then he also reminds them that such an, uh, an attitude on the part of people to rebel against God will bring his anger and his wrath. But then he also reiterates his purpose. He says, I have installed, I have placed as king over the nations this one, this descendant of Abraham, who we know as Jesus Christ. And look at what he says about him in the next verses, verse 7 and 8. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He, God the Father, I understand this, said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me. And I will surely give the nations. There's that word again. God the Father is saying to the Son, Ask of me, Son, Jesus Christ. I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. Hang on to that phrase. We're going to see it again in the mouth of Jesus. The ends of the earth. But God the Father says to God the Son, That promise that I made to Abraham, is going to be fulfilled in you and through you. All those nations that I wanted to bless are going to be blessed through you. I'm going to give the nations to you. I'm going to give the ends of the earth to you, God the Son. And so the rest of the psalm tells us that that ought to stir in us fear because of who this great God is, but it also ought to turn, stir in us a desire to take refuge and find blessing in the Son. And so the psalm ends in verse 12. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath will soon, may soon be kindled, but how blessed are all who take refuge in him. So how does this psalm end? It says that the destiny of the nations... Of every one of us in this room, every one of us on the planet is going in one of two directions. It is either his wrath will come or we will find blessing and refuge when we take refuge in him. So suddenly the sun becomes the lightning rod, the fork in the road for all of humanity. And those who will take refuge in him will find the blessing that that God first promised to Abraham long ago. So with that ringing in your mind, now let's jump point number three to the words of Jesus because Jesus is going to take this little word nations and talk about it quite a bit. But before we jump to the words of Jesus, let's let's talk a little bit about the word nations. You're going to see that it runs from Genesis to the book of Revelation. You're going to see that Jesus speaks about it many times. You don't think, most of you in this room and listening online, you don't think of what the Bible means when it uses the word nations. You don't think that. Because when I've read nations this morning, most of you think Pakistan, Iran, the United States, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Puerto Rico, etc. You think of political entities. But that's not how the word is used in the Bible. Nations is used to describe people groups that have their own language, their own culture, their own identity. There are 196 nations, as we use that word in the English language, political entities in the world today, 196. There are over 16,000 biblical nations in the world, people groups that have their own language, their own culture, their own identity. There are over 16,000 of them. And when God said, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth, he, didn't, he wasn't thinking of Pakistan or the United States or Brazil. He was thinking of all those individual people groups. That's why in Genesis 1, he said, all the families of the earth will be blessed in you. Jesus is going to take that word, nations. The Greek phrase is ta ethne. And he's going to use it repeatedly in his teaching. We're going to look at some of it. So with that promise, that purpose to reach, to bless the nations ringing in your mind, let's look at what Jesus says about it, beginning at Matthew 25. One of the parables Jesus told in Matthew 25 was a picture of the end of time. The end of time when we stand before him, Jesus, who is the judge of all the earth, when we have to give an account of our lives to him. And he presented this picture to us of himself, 
God the Son seated on his throne, and you'll see that he says the nations, the ta'ethne, the 16,000 families and groups are all assembled before him. Let's read it, Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And here it comes, and all the nations, now you know understand what that is. All the ta'ethne, those 16,000 distinct groups, will be gathered before him. He will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right. He will put the goats on his left. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the very first when I went said to Abraham that I would bless the nations of the earth. Some of you who are the sheep are going to be blessed. From all those 16,000 nations and families of the earth. That's the ones on the right, Jesus said. And the ones on the left jump down to verse 41. He will say to those on the left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And so there's this great separation that happens. But God is set in this day, like in every day of human history, to reach as many as will believe and will respond to the nations. And one day, some from all of those 16,000 groups will be reached. And as Jesus is about to tell us, and then the end of time will come. So in light of this great judgment, this great division that is coming, in light of the fact that Jesus will sit and will judge the nations, this is what he told us is coming, in light of that truth, he tells us what we should be about in our lives, Matthew 28. And you're going to see the phrase, ta'ethne, the nations again. Look at verse 18 of Matthew 28. Jesus came, this is after his resurrection, before he ascends into heaven. Jesus came, he spoke to his disciples, and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all ta ethne, all the nations. Make disciples of all the nations. Reach all the nations. Teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I say. And I will be with you even to the end of the age. Hold on to that phrase as well. To the end of the age. So we're easily ready to answer the question now. If someone asks you, what in the world is God doing? You as a Christian should be able to say, that's easy. He's reaching the nations. He's reaching the 16,000 ethnic groups all around the world. He's sending the gospel to all these different people groups. That's what he's up to. And he allows pandemics and he allows this and that and he sends people and, and he sends the gospel. He's reaching the nations. He said he would do it to Abraham. He's never stopped doing it. And we're going to hear a progress report this morning in just a minute. That continues on. Jesus said something similar in Luke 24. In Luke 24 he said uh, this. He said repentance for forgiveness of sins we will be proclaimed in, G in his name to Abraham. All the nations. There's that phrase again. That's God's great global purpose. In fact, this is such a central thing in what God is up to in the world that Jesus said he would not come back until this was done. Until the nations were reached, he will not return. Matthew 24, verse 14, he uses the phrase nations again. He says in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, those 16,000 groups, and then the end will come. Is Jesus coming back soon? I'm going to be a little contrarian because I hear a lot these days of Christians writing about we should be studying biblical prophecy, we should figure out where the pandemic fits in Revelation, all that thing. I don't think he's coming back soon. Because the only time marker he gave us for his return is that all the nations would be reached. And we're not close yet. There's a lot of people yet to be reached. He's, how could he be more clear? 
The gospel will be preached to all the nations. And then the end will come. So stop speculating about whether this leader or that leader or this president or that president or, you know, this natural disaster is signaling the end of time. Start thinking about what Jesus told you to think about. How are we going to fulfill the great commission and reach the nations? In fact, Jesus was so insistent that when his disciples got off track and started thinking about when is the end of time and all that, he brought them back to this, this purpose. Turn over to the book of Acts. The last words from Jesus before he ascended into heaven. Acts chapter 1. Just before he taken up into heaven after his resurrection, look at verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time? They wanted to know seasons, dates, times. Is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? In other words, when are you going to come back and finish your work? And here's what he said to him: It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has determined, has fixed by his own authority. But here's what you should concern yourself with. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Where did we hear that before? The ends of the earth. We heard it in Psalm 2 where God the Father says to God the Son, I'm going to give you all the nations. I'm going to give you the ends of the earth. So as Jesus ascends into heaven, the last thing he says to his disciples is, go to the ends of the earth. And as good Jewish people, they would have understood Psalm 2. Oh, that's Psalm 2. It's not for you to know times or epics. Don't worry about when the sun's going to come back. Stay on task. Stay involved in the mission to reach those nations that are lost. That's, and he reiterates this great global purpose in one of the most incredible miracles that speaks to us about what God is up to when the church begins. Point number four in your outline, the beginning of the church, this great global purpose is seen there again. So turn with me to Acts Acts chapter two. Do you remember that Jesus told his disciples that when he goes up into heaven, he says, wait for the power that you're going to have from the Holy Spirit. He's going to send you out to be my witnesses, to share the gospel, to the ends of the earth, wait till that happens. So when it happens, when the Holy Spirit comes, this is the beginning of the church. As we know it, we're still part of the church, the great cap, you know, capital C church. The church starts with a miracle. But pay attention to what the miracle is. It's not a miracle of healing. It's not a miracle of raising the dead. It's not a miracle of financial provision. It's a miracle of communication. It's a miracle of the nations hearing the gospel. As if God is saying, bam, the church begins. Look at this. Look at what I have just done. And remember that this is your purpose until I come back. Let's look at it in Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem. This is after the Holy Spirit comes. And you remember the disciples, the apostles begin to speak the word. And they have little tongues of fire on their head. And it, and, but, but what was going on here? Well, we know what was going on here. This was not some language that people couldn't understand. The text is so clear. Look at verse 5. The Jews were living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. God had brought together, this is a religious holiday in Judaism, and God had brought all these people from all these different nations, all these different ethnic groups, people groups, brought them into Jerusalem. There were Jews in Jerusalem from every nation. And verse 6, when the sound occurred, the crowd came together, they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language. They were amazed and astonished and saying, why are not, look, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we are hearing them in our own language to which we were born? And then he lists 16 nations. 
Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the districts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and Greeks, Cretans and Arabs. In verse 11, he reiterates it again. They reiterate, we are hearing them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. This is one of the great object lessons of Scripture where God is saying to us, his church, Miracles of healing, miracles of raising the dead, miracles of financial provision, miracles of deliverance from disasters, those are minor things. The great purpose of God, the miracle that is playing out every day around the world, is that God is bringing the gospel to more and more people who don't know him so that they can believe. Let's finish up and see in the last book of the Bible, point number five, how this all ends. And we know many of you will know this text. It's Revelation chapter five says this, verse nine. And there's these angels before the throne of Christ. And it says, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you, referring to Jesus, to take the book, to break its seals, for you were slain and you purchased for God With your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Just like Genesis chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 18, chapter 24, chapter 22. Just like it promised. We now get to look into the future and see where it all ends. Verse 10 uh, of of that passage. And you made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. In chapter 7. We see this happen again. Now it's verse 9. Now we see another scene in heaven in the book of Revelation. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count. Think about those words. Remember what God said to Abraham. The descendants of your seed, Jesus Christ, are going to be like the dust, like the stars. Like the sand that's on the seashore. Beyond number. And so we get to the end of time. And God gives us a picture of eternity. And he said, you're not going to be able to count all the people that I will have reached through my son and will have blessed. But this is who they will be. They will be from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. And they will stand before the Lord and before the throne, clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands. And they will cry out and they will say, salvation belongs to our God. This is what you've done for us. This is the great global purpose of God. So put it all together. In Genesis it says, I'm going to bless all the families and nations. Revelation adds tribes, tongue, peoples, nations. There's this picture. This is God's global purpose. So where are we at? Where are we at in the fulfillment of God's global purpose? If there are 16,000 people groups around the world, more than that, that have not yet been reached. You would think that God would have been working on this since Jesus ascended into heaven, and so he has. I'm going to play a short video for you the last three minutes for those of you online. If for some reason Vimeo takes it down, which sometimes they do without us knowing about it, just hang on, it's only three minutes. I'll be back. But for those of you who are in the room and hopefully those of you online, watch. What's a UPG? What's an unreached people group and how many are there? Let's watch this. What is a UPG? UPG stands for Unreached People Group, but to understand what that means, we need to first talk about people groups. When Jesus told his followers, go and make disciples of all nations, the Greek words he used were ta ethne, meaning all ethnic groups or people groups. So what is a people group? A people group is basically a group of individuals that have a common sense of history, language, beliefs, and identity. It is pretty much a group of people that considers us, us, and everyone else, them. While there are about 196 countries in the world today, there are over 16,000 distinct people groups. Let's look at Pakistan as an example. That is one nation going by our English word, but ethnically Pakistan has over 400 distinct nations, or people groups, within its borders. Around 7,000 of those 16,000 total people groups are considered UPGs, or unreached people groups. A group is considered unreached if less than 2% of their population is evangelical Christian. That is, it has too few true believers to evangelize and disciple the rest of the people group. Almost 3 billion people fall into this category. 
Over 3,000 of those 7,000 unreached people groups are considered UUPGs, or unengaged unreached people groups. These people groups have no churches, no believers, no missionaries, and no one actively focused on engaging them. 95% of all unreached people groups are located in the part of the world between 10 degrees latitude and 40 degrees latitude stretching from North Africa to Southeast Asia. We call this the 1040 window. It's in the 1040 window that most of the major non-Christian religions hold sway. Collectively, they are known as the Thumb People, tribal, Hindu, unreligious, including many Chinese, Muslim, and Buddhist. Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached as a testimony to Ta Ethne, all people groups, and then the end would come. Less than 3% of our total cross-cultural missionary force is working with unreached people groups. We must go to the unreached. At the same time, it's estimated that over 350 unreached people groups are living in the United States today as immigrants, refugees, and international students. We must welcome the unreached. Christ commands us to make disciples of all nations. Jesus is alive. His mission for us is clear, yet the task stands incomplete. Together, we can change that. What in the world is God up to? Now you know. And now you know what we as his people need to be up to. One of the cries of missions comes right out of Acts chapter 1, Psalm chapter 2. It says, to the ends of the earth, to the end of the age, we keep going. To the ends of the earth, to the end of the age. So what does that mean for us practically? A couple quick things and then the worship team is going to come up and lead us in a closing song. First of all, we need to be praying for our missionaries. We're going to get you a lot more specific information next week. But when you leave here today, would you just don't go out to your car. Just walk. If you go out these doors, go right and toward the coffee bar. We put a wall of all the pictures of our missionaries up there. We have people in some very difficult places of the world who are reaching the unreached. We need to pray for them. You look at those people. Lots of you will know them, some of them. Pray for them. Let it be a reminder to you to pray. We're going to show you a little bit better how to do that next week. Learn and care about the unreached people groups of the world. Do something to learn about the unreached people groups of the world. You know, we live in such an age where you can do that easily. You can go on your phone. I've done it uh, this week, and there are two. Just Google in your apps on your phone. You look, you look in your phone to read about Facebook. You read your email. You look at texts. You check the news. You check the weather. Download a little app called Unreached of the Day or UPG of the Day. There are two different apps. Just try it for a week. Just for a week. Open your mind to what might be out there, to the people groups that are out there that are unreached. Today, for instance, in the Unreached of the Day, there's a people called the Kumal in Nepal. There are 118,000 in this people group that are completely unreached with the gospel. We should know about that, and we should care about it. One final thing. Come next week, because next week we're going to go into a lot more detail about your engagement. We're going to see that there are three parts to God's plan for reaching all of those people groups, and you're involved in all three of them, whether you want to be or not, you should be. It's God's will. We're going to talk about that next week. Some of you are going to be deer hunting next week and you're not going to be here. I understand that. I won't judge you for that. It's okay. I used to deer hunt a lot myself. But if you're not here, hey, guess what? We have a miracle of technology. You can watch the message online. If you don't watch it online, I will judge you for that. Uh, <laughs> because you can. And you should care enough about the nations that you want your heart to be broken with the things that break the heart of God. So come next week or watch online next week when we wrap up this little look at the world. Let's stand for a closing song of worship.
Amen. Let's praise our God for the great things he's done and will do. And then will you pray with me? Uh, Father, we worship you as the God who longs to see this world made new. You have a heart for the nations. And God, in your gracious, sovereign wisdom, you've invited us to play a major role in reaching the nations. You invited us as your church, the people that you dwell in. This church is not, our church is not a building, it's not the walls of this room, but it is each and every person in this room in which your spirit lives. And God, you send us to accomplish your mission in the world. Thank you for your heart to see all peoples reached with the gospel. God, do great things in our midst and do great things in this world. We love you and pray all